for 78 years they have made the journey from the Panhandle, from the Gold Coast, and everywhere in between, all to be a part of Florida football. Never in all those seasons have Gator fans experienced a year like 1984. Never have they witnessed a team rise to meet a bigger challenge or a group of young men come together as one in pursuit of a common goal. Never has Florida football been more exciting or more successful. Never has any team worn the orange and blue with more pride and determination. Never has there been a season like 1984, the year of the Gator. the Gator began like anything but. Clouds of controversy hung over Florida. Charlie Pell had resigned as head coach and the starting quarterback was injured and out for the season. There was some good news. The Gators did have what looked like the best offensive line in college football. In Billy Henson, Bill Bromley, Jeff Zimmerman, Crawford Kerr, and Lomas Brown, they had a massive security blanket to protect a 19-year-old walk-on quarterback named Kerwin Bell. Bell improved quicker than anyone could imagine, coming of age in the opening loss to Miami. And then throwing for one touchdown and nearly 200 yards in a crucial tie with LSU. While the Great Wall blocked and Bell improved, Neil Anderson, John L. Williams, and Lorenzo Hampton loomed as the best trio of runners in Florida history. The kicking was solid as Chris Perkins tied a conference record with the 60-yard field goal. The men on the other side of the ball rose to the occasion, becoming the top rushing defense, top scoring defense, and top total defense in the rugged Southeastern Conference. Florida began 1984 with a win, a loss, and a tie, and no knowledge of what was about to take place. Program, State On September 29, a new era began for Gator football. For the first time ever, 44-year-old Galen Hall walked onto Florida Field as head coach. Galen Hall, 11 years offensive coordinator at Oklahoma. Galen Hall, one year and three games offensive coordinator and quarterback coach at Florida. With Mississippi State to be played, Galen Hall calmly took command of a strong ship in rough waters. Everything had happened so fast, uh, I was concerned with the offense and getting an offensive game plan against a team who I hadn't played before. Just the different defensive scheme that they had, uh, there really wasn't a lot of time, you know, to think. It really, uh, we, had, we had to come in and get the offensive plan done, and then we had to get practice schedules, and there really wasn't a lot of time to worry about anything like that. They were now Galen's Gators, orange-helmeted warriors with a new determination. They were loose and ready having fun on Florida Field. The offense continued its capacity to dominate with big plays. Both Neil Anderson and John L. Williams scored off the improving arm of Kerwin Bell. And Lorenzo Hampton flashed his speed on a 44-yard jaunt. Then a former All-State quarterback from Newberry put the final stamp on this new beginning. Ricky Natil, who would lead college football in punt returns, brought this one back 67 yards. 
and brought Florida its first triumph under Galen Hall. With the game plan conceived on the blackboard but carried out with the heart, the Gators showed they could rise above the swirling problems that surrounded them. It was a real trying time. Just a new coach and, and uh, there's so many uh, adversity we're facing at time of the year. And we just all got together and uh, we just made a goal throughout the season. We were going to win every game. And, and, uh, and we made it such a strong commitment that nothing was going to stop us. Tennessee wasn't about to stop them. Not Florida's big play offense. Frankie Neal's 50-yard reception became only a warm-up for the season's longest run. One of the Gators' most successful plays. A pitch sweep by Neal Anderson. That's been called by the coaches a lot of bread and butter play. And you just take the ball and uh, pitch it. Johnny L. Williams had a great block on it. And Jeff Zimmerman pulled around. And it's about all the line on pool, and it was just a race to the end zone from there. A race Anderson usually won, as number 27 would go on to move into second place in both career touchdowns and career rushing, with still another year to play. With Tennessee now looking for the pitch to Anderson, Galen Hall crossed them up with one of the surprise calls of the year. A reverse to Ricky Natiel who followed Kerwin Bell's block into the end zone, leaving the Vols wondering what would hit them next. The answer was John L. Williams with the season's most brilliant cutback run. The Gators passed their first conference road test with 43 points at Tennessee. They had shown their commitment was serious. They were pulling together. Their goal was the SEC championship. Before three of the most important games in Florida football history, there was another event that annually makes autumn in Gainesville an unforgettable experience. Welcome to Gator Growl and the biggest homecoming celebration in the world. Homecoming at Florida, a mini marathon, and a spectacular parade begins a monumental weekend for thousands of returning Gators. Many more attend the annual Florida Blue Key Banquet, which is a highlight of the political year in the Sunshine State. Gator Growl. The world's largest student-produced show fills Florida Field with bands, skits, and big-name entertainment, like the music of Herbie Hancock and the humor of Bill Cosby. Father's Day, ladies and gentlemen, which is one of the worst holidays on the face of this earth. On Saturday, the grand culmination of the weekend festival all the excitement of football at Florida Field. Go Gators! I have missed the game. It's played in Florida Field since I came out of service in 45. You know, the day is home coming, and we play Cincinnati. Yeah. I know. <laughs> For the capacity crowd, a high-scoring victory on Florida Field. And for everyone, a wild weekend of memories and fun. Another great homecoming celebration at the University of Florida. The smiles of homecoming quickly become history. It was time for some serious business. Not since 1973 has Florida been able to defeat Auburn and Georgia back to back. There was a quiet confidence among the players and their coach that 10 years was long enough. 
the largest crowd in Florida field history, welcomed preseason favorite Auburn to the home of the Fighting Gators. The special team set the tone for an emotional game, but the burden of the day fell upon the defense, who had to clamp a vice on college football's ninth best rushing attack. Auburn comes off the ball and they'll come right at you and, and they, you know, the idea of wishbone offense is here we come, you know, let's see if you can stop us. We uh, concentrated on having the inside linebackers do their certain jobs, stopping the fullback. Outside linebackers work on the pitch or the quarterback, whichever they, you know, they're assigned on a certain defense we call. The defensive strategy was for each man to do his job and then as a team, you know, they're a powerful offense. We felt like we could hold them down. Hold them down, they did, as there were many Gator heroes on this rainy, overcast day. Senior Roger Sybil with an interception, a quarterback sack, and nine solo tackles. And 285-pound middle guard Tim Newton with seven solo tackles. So dominant were the likes of Mark Corp, Pat Miller, and Alonzo Johnson, that the Gators held Auburn to their fewest yards in any game since Pat Dye installed the wishbone. There was a special pride of accomplishment in every big play. After a first half field goal, Florida scored three touchdowns. All three behind an offensive line that was controlling the game. All three on the exact same play. The play is called 36 tight. And what it is, it's a misdirection play. And um, the, our line did a great job on the play. The running backs are supposed to start one way. And the line pulls around and the running back turns and follows them. And Auburn has such a quick defense that they over pursue on the play every time. Quarterback Kerwin Bell takes. Bell gives off to Anderson, up the middle of the 35, the 30, Anderson the 20, Anderson the 5, touchdown, Neil Anderson and the Florida Gators have taken the lead. Well, sometimes you call a defense the right way, and it happens to hit, that time Auburn had the wrong defense call for the play the Gators call. Auburn was switching, Neil was passing it in the secondary before anyone could react. Usually when I come around on that play, it's usually a safety out there, and you have to you know, make a move on him or hope somebody makes a good block on him. And I was surprised when I got out there and open. I was waiting to fake somebody to either get hit, and no one was there. Two touchdowns by Neil Anderson, one by Lorenzo Hampton, all on 36 tight. And the Florida coaching staff had capitalized on Auburn's over-pursuing defense. The Tigers became Florida's sixth straight victim. 24 to 3. But only the battle had been won. The war was still to be decided. A war with the Georgia Bulldogs in Jacksonville. This was the big one, and the Gators came out growling. When Kerwin Bell fired a perfect strike to Lorenzo Hampton, the confident orange and blue never looked back. The defense turned the afternoon into a doggy roast. A body slam by Ricky Eastman. A flying tackle by Keith Williams. And a leaping theft by Jarvis Williams added fire to one of the great rivalries in college football. But a goal line stand inside the two gave the Gator defense one of its great accomplishments of this or any season. Four times Georgia tried. Four times, Roger Sybil, Ron Moten, Arthur White, and friends dug in and said no. The goal line stand will find its place in Florida football tradition. It took the fight out of the dogs and set up a totally unexpected play that clinched this coveted victory over Georgia. A play that would be the second longest pass in Florida history. Probably one of my biggest plays this year was the 96 yarder against Georgia, which um, I think probably really locked up the game. It was after the goal line stand. Um, we had the ball on the one yard line, and, and when I went in, um, Coach Hall had told me that that we would try to just run the ball out and get some yardage so we could punt the ball. I just thought it was a chance. Uh, 
to put the game away, to uh, we made the goal line stand. Uh, if it wasn't complete, we'd punt out of the end zone. If it was intercepted, hopefully we tackle there. It's just like a punt. So as I come out of the huddle, um, I read the secondary, and, and it was man coverage. I put Ricky and Gary Roll on the outside. And when I hiked the ball and got the ball, I started going back, and Gary's man gave him a little bit more cushion than what I expected. So by the time I took my second crossover, I come back to my left, which, which I knew Ricky had the great speed. And I come back, and I, I seen he was already even with his man. And um, I knew then that, that we had six points if I just put it there. So I just tried to lay it out there. And I just laid it out, and, um, and I knew he was close to the sideline. I knew if he called it and stayed in, it would still be six points, and it was a touchdown. A touchdown it was, as Georgia joined Auburn on the Gator casualty list. Neither could score a touchdown on Florida. The Gators were in the driver's seat for the conference title. What thoughts flashed through the minds of young men on the threshold of accomplishing what has never been done before? Here were the Gators at Kentucky. One victory away from their first SEC crown in 52 years. And they were not about to let it slip from their grasp. Kerwin Bell's accuracy would frustrate Wildcat coaches. As the freshman quarterback picked at the Kentucky secondary. But it was the right foot of senior place kicker Bobby Raymond that kept Florida in the surprisingly tough struggle. He had hit on five field goals, and Galen Hall needed one more pressure kick from Raymond to give the Gators a cushion. Bobby Raymond's sixth and most important kick of the game was perfect, but Kentucky still would not die, and it took a final big play by the defense to ensure a championship. Florida 25, Kentucky 17. Ramsdale puts him down. Well, I was reading a quarterback. I was reading his eyes, and I noticed that everybody else had their man covers covered as soon as the quarterback noticed it. And I saw him when he looked at the tight end, and that's when I started breaking. Guns it right side, it's intercepted! Was it intercepted? I believe it was by Adrian White. Intercepted by White. But the Gators have stopped the Wildcat drive with one minute and 16 seconds left in the game. Oh, Adrian. You don't know what you've done for Gators everywhere. Well, I realized that the game was over, unless we made a big mistake. And I was just happy. The whole team was happy. But it's been no bed of roses. What I remember most about the whole season, it really wasn't even in the game. The part I remember is coming back um, after the Kentucky game, flying back on the plane and uh, riding through town and you know, just hearing all the horns blowing and coming out here with all the fans being out here. That's, that'll be the part that I'll never forget. feeling for me that I'm sure that I am new at Florida this is my first year that uh, 
if, if it felt that, that good to me, I know what it felt to the people that, you know, they had, they had never experienced it before. With the best record in the Southeastern Conference secure, the Gators closed this remarkable season with their fourth straight triumph over arch-rival Florida State, 27-17. In the mud at Tallahassee, John L. Williams finished as one of the most versatile backs in Florida history, leading the team in receptions and gaining over 800 yards rushing. With nine wins against a schedule that included eight bowl-bound teams, Galen's Gators had become what many considered the best team in college football. You know, I think every man on our, on our squad had a major role right on down to the freshmen, the red shirts, everyone all along the line. And I think everybody has that same feeling of, you know, hey, I was a part of this. Yes, those who were a part of it and those who watched will forever cherish vivid memories of 1984. Bleeding images dancing through the mind of an unknown walk-on quarterback named Kerwin Bell, who developed into the fourth most proficient passer in college football, won the Nashville Banner SEC Player of the Year Award, and became the most accomplished freshman quarterback in the history of college football. Of the Anderson, Williams, Hampton, triple threat, the most prolific and dangerous trio of runners in any backfield anywhere. Of the Great Wall of Florida, a massive offensive line that allowed the Gators to outrush all but one opponent. Of all conference center, Phil Bromley, number 50. And Lomas Brown, a consensus All-America tackle. Of big play, clutch receivers, Ricky Natil, Gary Roll, Ray McDonald, and Frankie Neal. As the explosive Gators rip enemy defenses with 42 plays that gain 20 or more yards. The memories continue of a proud, punishing defense that viewed each game as an alley fight. Of underclassmen like Alonzo Mitz and Leon Pennington, who established solid credentials as stoppers. Of all-conference senior Tim Newton, finishing a brilliant career. and junior Alonzo Johnson, who emerged from the shadow of Wilbur Marshall and, like his predecessor, won All-America honors at linebacker. Of Ray Criswell's booming punts and the record-setting kicks of Bobby Raymond and Chris Perkins. Of Galen Hall, the man who put it all together and was named SEC Coach of the Year, whose calm, relaxed approach earned him the trust and respect of all who played for it. But maybe the most powerful and compelling memories of 1984 will be of a group of young men who refused to acknowledge the adversity that surrounded them, who came together as a team and turned the trials of September into the triumph of December. Young men who gave the University of Florida its best regular season record and highest national ranking ever. Who won a championship on the field and made 1984 a year never to be forgotten. The year of the Gator.
On behalf of the 1984 Gator football team, staff, coaches, and players, I'd like to extend my thanks to Sunbank for the help of Gator football in this highlight film. Thank you all, but it's been no better road. 